Um, we're learning stuff every year about industrial hemp and the administration of the program. Things have changed a lot in just the last year. I started at KDA in 2016 and uh, was amazed at all the issues with industrial hemp and the excitement and the new people that were coming to agriculture. This is a uh, unique industry and crop. We have kind of hemp activists on one side. We've got traditional farmers on the other side. We've got people that are entirely new to agriculture. They're excited about hemp production. So what we want to do today is go back in time and get you kind of the lay of the land. Look at how things were, how we got to where we are today. Our former commissioner, James Comer, now Congressman Comer, was really the instigator of industrial hemp in Kentucky. So in 2013, we had some state legislation that said, if the federal government legalizes industrial hemp or delists it from the controlled substances list, we want Kentucky to be at the forefront of this industry. There is not a lot of new industries coming into agriculture. And you all know as good as anyone that agriculture is hurting right now. Cattle and grain prices are not good. We're looking for anything that can possibly work in Kentucky. Now, 2013, fast forward a year later to that old farm bill that comes around every five years. And the farm bill included industrial hemp research. It did not legalize industrial hemp. So if you meet someone out here today that says, yep, I've been growing hemp for 10 years in Kentucky, they have not been growing hemp legally in Kentucky. So we still do not have legalized industrial hemp. What we have is a limited window for research to be conducted by state departments of agriculture or institutions of higher education. Uh, Tom mentioned this is a KDA program, but I assure you that it would not be here today without UK. Uh, the same could be said of Murray State, uh, other universities across Kentucky that have really been our partners. We are not chemists, we are not experts, we are not uh, agronomy specialists. We are dependent on the, the support we get from UK and we're not able to organize events like this literally because we do not have time. This program has grown so rapidly uh, and we are struggling to keep up with the demand which is a good problem to have. So if, you, if you're curious, it's section 7606 of the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is this great big old thing, you know, a lot of programs. Well, the, the hemp thing is pretty short and sweet. Uh, it's about one page, and the key point is the growth, cultivation, or marketing of industrial hemp is what we're allowed to research. Now, how do you research marketing? Do you send out some surveys and hope you get some information that we could put in a report? No. Uh, the previous administration said we're going to get real-world data we're going to let farmers grow this stuff, and we're going to see what they can get for it at a price. And a part of that has been to support a processing industry in Kentucky. It's, it's no secret that the more processors, the more buyers you have closer to home, the more competitive advantage is for Kentucky's industrial hemp industry. So we didn't make up this rule about 0.3% uh, THC. So that's not 3% THC. I think most of you know what that is. THC is the psychoactive component of cannabis that gets you high. So there is absolutely no difference between industrial hemp and marijuana except for this measuring stick. So it is essential. If we talk about um, being good relations, having good relations with state police or our law enforcement community, uh, this is something we cannot get around. So does it mean that 0.4 gets you high? Does it mean that 1% gets you high? Probably not. State police tell us that, you know, marijuana is 5 to 10, 20, 30, 40 percent THC is what's uh, being grown in states like Colorado, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, states that have recreational marijuana. However, 0 0.3 is what we have to work with. That is set in federal law. You say, why is it 0 0.3? There is a million different stories about why it's 0.3. Tom's got a good one he may tell later about uh, in Europe, some different countries had varieties that were predominantly under this amount of THC, so in effort to give them more uh, advantage over their neighbors that had higher THC industrial hemp, that level was set. I've heard several different variations of that story. Don't think of hemp as one crop. It is really three crops, and there are some varieties that are dual purpose, but uh, you've got to think of this in terms of its final use, its market. Each one has unique production issues. Each one has different incentives on price. Some of it's easier to grow than others, depending on what kind of inputs you're using on your farm. Seed and grain, of course, the same stuff, just the, the grain is what we're crushing, and industrial hemp has a protein and an oil content, just, just like soybeans you'd be crushing. Uh, if you go to Kroger today, you can find a lot of hemp products. We're going to have some hemp hot dogs here today. Uh, the other component is fiber. Uh, the fiber has been our smallest part of our program to date. 
really fiber's got to be tied in to its end use. So it's not something you can just grow any type of fiber and uh, it'll be the exact kind that everybody wants to buy. There are certain varieties that can be harvested at the right time. Some hemp can be uh, really tiny, almost like wheat stubble. Some hemp can be like a tree. I mean, it is thick and material, so uh, all fiber is not created equally, but uh, there are some exciting things going on. And I don't know if, uh, is Trey Riddle, Sunstrand on the agenda today, Tom? Yes, so you're gonna hear from one of the smartest guys in the industry. He, he's not one of these pie in the sky, gives you hype type numbers. He can talk about what's actually going on here in Kentucky and why industrial hemp is not the end all be all fiber. It's just another tool in the toolbox for Kentucky farmers. This last one, plant extracts, cannabidiol. Uh, there are a lot of compounds in the industrial hemp plant, just like there are in the marijuana plant. Uh, the most exciting one that has been of interest to our program participants is cannabidiol. So we're gonna call it CBD, because I'll mess up saying it if I try too much. But the big picture is the cannabis plant has all these cannabinoids. THC is one of those cannabinoids. Cannabidiol is another cannabinoid and there's probably 70 or 100 other ones. We're just now learning about these properties. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are passionate about this part of industrial hemp. Uh, they believe it has medical benefits. Uh, there are a lot of issues federally, as we'll talk about, about this last one, but it's the one that's got most people excited. Everything was looking good last year until about August, and uh, we did have a few uh, good things. This document was called the Statement of Principles on Industrial Hemp. And if you've got your smartphone or a tablet, you may just want to go ahead and pull up our website. I'm going to be referencing a lot of that. It's www.kyagr.com forward slash hemp. And you can actually read this whole document, Statement of Principles. This came out from three federal agencies, USDA, FDA, and DEA. Uh, and they were perfectly fine with Kentucky farmers being private growers under KDA's authority. That was something they didn't like at first. We had to take them to court in 2015. but they have publicly admitted that that's a legitimate part of industrial hemp research as long as you're acting as an agent of a Department of Agriculture. They also made it eligible for some uh, research funding. Another thing that was good is, is right before this came out, they did allow us to begin certifying industrial hemp as an organic crop in the United States. So it had been organically certified in Canada and other countries, but we had not been able to certify organic hemp in Kentucky until after about this time in August last year. There's always some bad news though. According to USDA, DEA, and FDA, uh, all the cannabinoid research, all the floral material, anything except for grain and fiber is illegal. This is a big deal. So we caution our participants, and if you're thinking about getting in this industry, you have to realize this is the uncertain environment you're entering. So we've got this unique situation where there is uh, cannabidiol being sold over the counter online. You're going to hear some businesses here that are doing a lot of sales, a lot of stuff. The FDA has sent out warning letters. They've acted like they're against it. There was this document, but there has been no enforcement on this today. Their argument is that we do not have the ability to research the floral material extracts, that we can only research grain and fiber. Well, we disagree with that. And a lot of this, you know, states as laboratories of democracy is challenging what the federal agencies are putting out. So Commissioner Quarles is committed to fighting this. He was in D.C. last week advocating for our cannabidiol research. He says we should not assume this plant is going to have the exact same markets and usages as our granddaddies did. We're not making rope and, and, and sales, you know, for ships anymore with this stuff. We want to research all aspects of industrial hemp, including the CBD extracts. The other stinker was they, DEA doesn't think we can move hemp seeds and plants across states. Now we've been doing that for three years now and we've had a few issues uh, there was also a, a provision set in the last budget bill, the omnibus bill, that said no federal dollars can be used to interfere with states' industrial hemp research. So we reiterated that to the DEA at a conference this summer, and they said something kind of scary, and it's something to take to you know, consider. Uh, they have a lot of funds that aren't restricted by the federal government. And that was very odd to me, but uh, that's the reality of working with this agency. And the reason is industrial hemp is a controlled substance, just like you know, cocaine, morphine, a lot of illicit drugs, they're on the exact same list. And hemp is still marijuana at the federal level. So keep that in mind, you talk about what you want to do, just realize all these rules and paperwork and paper uh, bureaucracy we've got is for a reason. 
So what's coming ahead? I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, Jeff Sessions, our new Attorney General, the DEA is under the Department of Justice, so he's Jeff Sessions, the AG, is the ultimate decider of that, but his boss is Donald Trump, and if you can predict what Donald Trump's doing, you're smarter than me. We don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to continue to advocate for our farmers. We're not going to sit back and let this industry waste away. We've had too much progress. As we'll see in a minute, you can, I'm pretty amazed at the growth we've had in just a few years. And to reiterate, this is what Commissioner Quarles' opinion is on the matter. He wants industrial hemp to expand and prosper in Kentucky, and if it ever is legalized at the federal level, or there's some change that makes it not a controlled substance, we want to be, have Kentucky position to be a national leader. And today, both in terms of acreage, of industry development, Kentucky and Colorado are kind of the top two dogs in industrial hemp. There's our three core directives. We want to empower growers and processors. Number two is important. Uh, you know, we are dependent. We mentioned UK and universities, but law enforcement is our other partner in this. So we've got uh, hemp policies and procedures that we developed this year, and every one of them we ran by state police. So if you're thinking about getting this program and you don't want the police flying over helicopters on your farm, this program is not for you. We register every single hemp field in Kentucky. We've got 12,800 acres this year. Every one of those has a map that is on an iPad that whenever state police and National Guard fly over with their helicopters as part of the cannabis suppression unit, they'll start flying in June, they'll go all across the state until harvest time, and we want them to know where our hemp is at. We don't want them mistakenly landing in a hemp field thinking it's marijuana. And the last one, if you're a program participant, you may say that's probably not true. Eliminate redundant steps and requirements. We, we have a lot of paperwork. So my dad, he doesn't like filling out his census. We farm in Callaway County. If you don't like filling out your census, you are not going to like doing this hemp program. It is enough paperwork to drive you nuts. And all that's for a reason. We don't do that just to make ourselves feel good. It's to keep everybody legal and compliant. Some things we've done today, I mentioned that website. If you have any interest whatsoever, uh, please read that policy guide. It's got the rules, the explanations of why we do what we do. We've also expanded our, process, our kind of reliability and stability of processors by having multi-year MOUs. MOU is just the memorandum of understanding. That's the agreement we sign, kind of a legal contract with a private processor or a private grower to be a part of KDA's program. First year, I wasn't around 2014, but uh, the seed got here late. We didn't have many people interested in the program yet. It was still just getting started at the federal level. The farm bill had just passed. It was a scramble to get things going. Uh, year two, we were up to 1,700 acres approved. About 900 of that was planted. I believe 15 was a wet year. I don't know why the big drop in there, but we only actually had about 500 acres harvested. As you'll see, one of the big reasons we have uh, crop failures on industrial hemp in Kentucky, especially on the grain varieties, is because you're not allowed to use any pesticides. So think about you, you nightmare mare's tail and Johnson grass and pigweed, and I have seen pretty fields just covered up now because there's not any chemicals you're able to use. But that hasn't stopped our program growth. 4,600 acres approved last year, about half of that was actually planted. And I think it's going to be about 2,000 acres harvested. We're still compiling 2016 production reports. Those were all due in December of last year. And we have been scrambling to get the new program going for 2017 so we can start ordering seeds. All of the seeds that are planted in Kentucky have to first come to the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. The growers arrange private deals. They make the contacts. A lot of them hire seed brokers. Uh, they make that arrangement independent of us, but then we provide them with our DEA Schedule 1 import permit. All that seed has to first come to KDA. We inspect the bags, make sure it is what it purports to be, and then the farmer comes and picks that up. So you can imagine 60,000 pounds of seed. We don't have a big warehouse, so it's a challenge for us logistically to manage all that seed. Uh, some of this stuff is being grown in Kentucky. We'll hear from some other speakers that we do have certified varieties that have been brought from Canada and elsewhere that are pretty established. Uh, we will eventually be producing more seed domestically, especially here in Kentucky, but we are still importing quite a bit of it. That last bullet point's important. The most interest in our program has not been on the grain and fiber, it has been on this CBD stuff. And the reason won't surprise you is it's, it's the most money right now, or it has been last year. But it is a dynamic, uh, ever-changing industry. We'll get some dollar figures here at the end, uh, but just realize that those are estimates. I have seen this industry go 
from $1,000 a pound we were hearing this time last year to in 20, at the end of 2016, we were hearing $10 a pound for dried floral material extracts. So you can hear different prices depending on who you ask. And uh, we got some processors in here that can tell you the, the market has been pretty wild. And that's because this is a new, new product that has not been on the market legally before. If you're curious, we got about a half a million square feet of greenhouse across the state. Our acreage is up pretty big. Our number of participants is big. We also implemented an appeals process this year that we just finished up last week that worked pretty well. 2017, my goodness, what have we done? We got so many acres, I don't know how we're going to get all this done. We're going to try. Uh, we're excited about this growth though. Look at those processors across the state. Um, we say we got 40 processors. If you're thinking of a processor as someone who's actively looking to buy your hemp product, uh, be more like the 12 to 15 processors. Some of these are self-processors. They still have to register as a processor. Uh, that one in Davis County is a lab that has to be registered to be able to physically hold and test this product. What are we researching? We're looking at planning dates. We're, we're trying to remember what we forgot, what our granddaddies figured out. A lot of these varieties uh, have come out of Colorado, and some of the CBD stuff, so we're unfamiliar with this uh, production model. Some of it resembles tobacco. They're setting it with a carousel setter. Um, other aspects are nothing like tobacco. We're looking at the equipment. We don't want this to be something that every farmer's got to go out and buy a new uh, $100,000 harvesting equipment or some kind of deal. We want this to work with what we've got. As you'll hear from Tom and others later, uh, there's some exciting things on the animal feed side. We're still getting some of that regulatory issues. Currently, you're not allowed to sell it as feed, uh, but there are several people instigating that through UK Reg Services to make sure that's legal, and that's going to be a, a viable market, especially here in Kentucky. Think about your poultry. Think about your equine industry, your cattle industry. And if you didn't hear what I said earlier, this last thing at the bottom is critical. You cannot put any pesticides on it, and it is... Uh, I've seen better success when someone planted hemp in a really clean, following a very clean soybean field or tobacco field. Um, if you go out and till up some old pasture and think hemp will grow with sunshine and happiness and well-wishing, it won't. It doesn't do well. It needs a, just all the expertise that you put out for your corn and bean crop and your tobacco crop. It, it is not a magic crop. If someone tells you it grows on a rocky hillside, it, it doesn't. It, it needs good ground, good fertility, and it is... Uh, very uh, favorable to well-draining soils. All right, just to kind of wrap up, this is where everybody wants to know what we're getting for it. How much is it? Well, you're in a pretty good area. You've got a lot of farmers that can tell you what they're getting individually, but just some rough production estimates from mostly 2015. We also made some adjustments in 2016 based on a few reports. 65 to 75 cents per pound being contracted. Uh, We've had a farmer, I believe in Clark County, get 1,600 pounds of seed per acre. So if you do the math on that, that is beating the far out of corn and beans right now. However, we still have, some farmers have total crop failures, back to the herbicide. So uh, don't look at that and say, that's what K KDA is guaranteeing me to get that. That is absolutely not true. We have some people that are making zero money, and they're losing money from all that seed cost they invested, but others are having successes. Fiber is kind of unique. It, it really depended on your end use. We mentioned earlier, uh, others will talk about the different, the bast and the herd fibers and different applications, but uh, we're excited about the fiber and I, I think that is going to be a, a long-term part of this program. CBD is what everybody wants to do. Um, there is a, a pretty passionate group of people in the state that either have kids who have uh, neurological diseases, seizures, that sort of thing that swear by CBD extract. That is their, um, they're, they're passionate about it. They're passionate about their kids' health and who, who could blame them for that. But there's a lot of hype about this stuff, a lot of talk, and it's difficult to figure out who is telling you something legitimate or not in this industry. Um, CBD is, is, as we mentioned earlier, the federal government doesn't think we have the right to extract it from industrial hemp. Um, we, we disagree with that, but that's just something to understand as you consider participating in this program and making these investments, uh, CBD thinking in tomorrow. Who in the world knows what the federal government's gonna do on recreational marijuana? It's kind of silly to think if they're letting them do that, why are they beating us up on industrial hemp extracts? But uh, who knows, time will tell. And 
We're hopeful in uh, the next couple months we will have our 2016 production reports. We continue to improve those every year, asking better questions and making sure we're giving you tangible research as a result of this program. Mention the website again, you really should pull this up. Don't wait and forget about it later because I don't have these printed out. Um, if you do need a copy of this slide, we're going to make that available, I think, through UK and have that on their website. So, But I would encourage you to write down this website at least, www.kygr.com forward slash hemp. Read that policy guide. Understand that we've got a gob of paperwork. You're going to have to give, um, give the right for KDA personnel, state police, or any other law enforcement to come look at your hemp facilities at any time. So if you store your hemp seed in your seed shed, they have the right to come on there anytime they want to. Uh, this is a big deal because we need law enforcement. If we don't have their uh, partnership in this, we're, we're not gonna have a program. Also the transfer requirements, you can't just grow hemp and sell it to anybody. There is a, a list of which products are allowed to be sold to the general public versus those that can be sold to another processor in the program. We have allowed people, farmers, to sell their materials to another state's duly registered hemp program participant. Um, but we don't let you sell it on the open market. You can't just go out and put it on eBay and say I've got hemp seeds for sale. They're still a controlled substance. It's very confusing uh, when you look at that transfer requirements. Hemp stalks are not considered a controlled substance. As long as they don't have seed or leafy material, bud material on them, uh, you can go on eBay and buy those right now. The seed is absolutely controlled because that's just marijuana in DEA's mind. So that is regulated. If the seed is not viable, if you're crushing that seed, that protein powder and that oil, those can go on the market. You can go to Kroger's right now and see hemp hearts. It's, it's, it's legal. The questionable stuff is the CBD extracts, the, or all the floral material extracts. That's what we are unsure of long term, but certainly no other of those have offered such a high return potential for a small amount of acreage as that last one. If you're thinking, I'm going to plant some hemp, I like this stuff, I'm going to do it this March, well, you're out of luck. Because if you didn't apply to the program last November, uh, you cannot grow in 2017. Now, we have made an effort to have more processors. We really want them as, as much as we can. Uh, they have until June 1st to get their applications in and be reviewed. Um, there is a background check. If you've been convicted of a, a, any kind of drug crime in the last 10 years, a misdemeanor, or any felony in the last 10 years, you cannot be in this program. And we ask for background checks for anybody that's working on your farm and handling this hemp every day. Um, and I, I know a lot of farmers don't want more background checks and have people having their information out there. If you're a participant in this program, your name and county at least will be on a website. And uh, people will track you down and be wanting to sell you stuff. And there's a lot of processor and, and farmer network, which is really what we need. That's a good thing. We want farmers to choose different processors to look out and diversify. Um, the way it's kind of developed is there's been these processor groups. So a lot of times a company will hire a farmer outreach person and they're out recruiting farmers to grow for that company next year. Others are completely independent. They don't know a single processor. They just know they got a little ground and they're interested in doing this. Both of those are fine. The only catch is you have to have a marketing plan when you apply. The only incorrect answer is I'm going to grow it and let KDA buy it or try to figure out somebody to buy it. That's, we're not buying you hemp. So. You have to have made the effort to identify a buyer for your hemp, whatever, whether it's fiber, grain, or the floral material extract. So that's on the participants, a lot of legwork. You're not bound by any one processor. You can have five processors for all we care. Uh, we just want you to make sure that you're making an effort to sell that product at the end of the year. This is, we're not gonna go through this kind of nerdy. We've already talked about most of it, but uh, just know that it's a, a lot of paperwork and it's for a reason. We have policies that are going to be changing, uh, I, I imagine, even this year. We've got a bill coming up in this General Assembly session to kind of streamline what was passed before the Farm Bill and what the Farm Bill actually authorized. Um, and we continue to get a lot of input, so none of these policies are set in stone. If we could fast forward a year from now, I couldn't tell you what the program rules are going to be. Uh, we do have fees, $350 per growing location. And that was uh, put in new this year in an attempt to make people put their hemp in a similar location. We had some folks that were putting an eighth of an acre here and three counties over they had another two acres and it was a nightmare to go sample. We have to visit every single hemp field and collect a sample. The way that works is um, about two weeks before you're ready to harvest you have to send us a report saying I intend to harvest two weeks from now. 
So we will wait and try to get as close to that as possible without going over because we know you're ready to harvest. And we will send a KDA inspector out there to take a sample. And right now it's the top 20 centimeters of the plant. We'll take five cuttings from the field, put it in a brown paper bag, write your MOU number on it, take it back to KDA, we dry it in our lab, and then we send it off for third party testing. And that'll be a THC test. We don't do CBD level tests. We're not providing there's a lot of participants that would like us to. We're concerned with the THC level. Uh, we have varieties that have gone over. So if you go to that website, you can pull up a list. It'll be called the prohibited varieties list for 2017. We had several varieties that had a random high test. We had some that are very established varieties that have been grown in Canada for decades that threw a high test. And by high test, I mean something over 3,000 parts per million. So 0.3%, remember, is our THC limit. Um, some varieties were being grown by 30 different people, so they had more tests and maybe a, a smaller portion of those tested high. So anything that ever tested high, we've called a variety of concern. And this is not because someone maliciously grew it, trying to grow marijuana, that's not what this is. These are plants, and they're very photosensitive, as others will tell you here today. Um, if I go sample on a Monday versus that Friday, the THC level could have changed dramatically. So it's very important for us to learn about these varieties, understand that it's not something that we can make a rule and control for. Plants are, are you're out in nature. It's very dependent on light. A lot of different things going on, but uh, those varieties are listed. I encourage you to diversify. Don't plant 100 acres of the same variety that you got from somebody you met online in the Colorado chat room. You know, we've got crazy stories, I could tell you. Um, do your background checks. Make sure you're working with good people. Um, don't, don't partner with someone that's kind of questionable, maybe doesn't want to be a part of our program, but wants to help you or consult, you know, pay attention to those things. So our greenhouses, we will come inspect those. That's obviously a little bit bigger risk because they're not in a physical, you know, planted location. They can be moved around. They're in potted plants. Um, we will come out and inspect those. We mentioned our fees. Uh, if anyone changes their field location, which I realize is hard to predict in January, where exactly you're going to plant, you know, a 10 acre field. Because you've got a lot of choices where you could plant, it's depending on what's wet and dry when. Um, but we have decided that we're going to set those in stone. Those are in your MOU, the GPS location of those fields. And the reason is, last year we were having to go out and collect those coordinates ourselves and then report, compile all those in Excel file and then send those to state police. Well, starting June 1st, they are hitting the road in their helicopters going out flying over across Kentucky. So this year we're going to be able to give them in about two weeks all of our coordinates done for the year along with maps, and that's really to protect our growers. But if something comes up and you absolutely have got to move a field, we understand that happens. You'll just have to pay for that cost because we're going to have to do a whole lot of work to update state police. So we mentioned our law enforcement cooperation is essential. Uh, Commissioner Quarles it does not waver on that. So if that bothers you working with law enforcement and having law enforcement snooping around in your greenhouse or bins, and this program's not for you. Here's the man, David Williams. Apart from Tom, David Williams has been our greatest partner on uh, university research and really just a sounding board. So we are entirely dependent on these universities and their cooperation. We're committed to being a leader on this nationally. We're going to host a hemp regulators conference. So this is all the other state departments of agriculture that have in states that have passed some kind of industrial hemp legislation. Uh, there's no other model except for Kentucky and Colorado. Colorado's got its own issues. They have recreational marijuana and industrial hemp. Uh, if you ask a lot of our processors, and when people come in and talk about investing in Kentucky to our office, it is a benefit that we don't have recreational or medical marijuana. Now, there are several program participants that would disagree. They think that that ought to be different, but uh, for our industrial hemp program, it's essential that we don't have that other stuff. It has been a benefit to us that we are just an industrial hemp state. I know UK is also organizing a uh, kind of multinational agronomy meeting here in, Lex or in Lexington. Uh, last week, Commissioner Quarles was in D.C. meeting with all of our congressmen and senators. We do have support at the federal level for industrial hemp. There's some concern about the floral material extract, a lot of confusion about what that is. Is it, you know, do we have medical marijuana now or not? So it's going to be an uphill battle to educate everyone in Washington, but uh, commissioners committed to doing that. Here's our contact information. Uh, if you have any kind of general questions, hemp at ky.gov. You're more than welcome to uh, call me anytime. 
You can call the main line. You'll also get my desk phone there. Uh, my email is brent, B-R-E-N-T, dot burchett, B-U-R-C-H-E-T-T, at ky.gov. Uh, if you forget that, just go on the KDA website, type in staff directory. You can find all those on there.